All right, tonight. <clears throat> tonight is a super ambitious Facebook Live broadcast. Hopefully it gets crowded. Uh, I have a lot more stuff on the table this time, which I'm sure you guys can see. Going forward, John Hopman's here. Tony Katner joined. All right. Let me adjust that camera a little bit. I'm going to be standing for part of this, and there's no point in having my head chopped off. Hey, On Point Holsters. Thanks for stopping by. I'm going to do some of this seated and some of this standing. i got a lot of stuff on the table. This is going to be a fast-paced evening. Hello, Shane Muse. Uh, one of the things you guys probably don't know about me, hi, Chris Johnson, hi, PJ Como, uh, is I desperately need glasses, and I don't have them. Will Silk, Shane Muse, yes. As usual, if you are a Kydex shop, please post your company name in the comments. Uh, I'm not going to be responding to as many comments tonight because I'm managing a whole bunch of stuff on the table. I will go through at the end of the video as usual and answer in text any comments I was not able to answer in the course of the live video. Another cold day in the shop, huh? Yeah, it's a little chilly. Hi, Keith Freeman. Has met holsters in the house. Cody, Jed. It's a party. So, uh, I already got some surprised questions from people asking if I was planning to stop making swift presses, if I was getting out of the former business, and uh, no. No, I'm not getting out of the former business. Tim Anderson, horn rim glasses would suit me. Maybe, maybe they would, John. So, why am I telling you guys how to build your own non-membrane former when I myself sell membrane form, non-membrane formers? Aren't I throwing away my own market share? Hi, Eric Olson, 508's here, Jason Davis is here. Um, the reason why I'm doing a broadcast where I tell you everything I can think that's helpful about how to build your own non-membrane former is because I want to see this industry advance. I want to see the better shops have more tools at their disposal to succeed, to make quality holsters quickly and consistently. excuse me, and to start putting the shops that shouldn't be in business anymore out of business. So, uh, Rob's Holster is this here, Conrad Miller is here. All right, uh, last Facebook Live broadcast, I gave away a CNC machined HDPE mold. I'm doing it again. Another copy of the same mold. I went through my batch, I ended up having three 1911 molds that had a small nick on them. So I've got another 1911 5-inch HDPE mold. If you share the feed, you are entered in to win this mold. Conrad, you still can't win it, same as last time. I'll come a little closer so you can see this in the camera. This is one that Conrad Miller designed. I machined. It's a railed 5-inch 1911. And so if you like the feed and share the feed, now while it's happening, uh, I will go through and draw from that list of people who shared the feed, and one of you will get a free mold. Obviously, previous winners, like Jeremy Gibbs of Pagan Ridge Tactical, are excluded, so you can't win again. Uh, so please like the feed, please share the feed, awesome. All right, so I'm going to dive right into it. So non-membrane forming simply refers to a vacuum former that doesn't use any silicone membrane. The kydex itself forms the vacuum seal and collapses down onto the plastic when vacuum pressure is applied. Oh, I forgot one major piece. One second, let me go grab something. I forgot one important part. All right, I 
am back. Thank you guys all for spending your Tuesday evening with me. Eric Powell's here. Clark's here, I'm out. Yeah, I think that too. I would leave if it weren't my broadcast. So, a non-membrane former uses the codex itself. There's no membrane involved. And there are a few important features that this immediately affects. The first one is non-membrane forming requires you to use more plastic. And this is one of the places where a lot of guys lose interest. They look at the amount of waste and they no longer want to use it. I've had to move the camera back a little bit so that I can get my whole self in the shot, which means from here I really can't read your comments. Um, I apologize for that. I will occasionally pause and lean forward. That's me reading Jim Gedville's here, Hi, Hi Iron Wolf. Um, but guys often get a little bit upset when they realize how much extra plastic it's going to cost them and they're unable to see the advantages and where the cost of that plastic not only comes out in the wash but is completely swallowed up in the increased efficiency of the process. So a non-membrane vacuum former has only a very few very simple parts. You need a frame. You need something to press down around your mold to cause the kydex to hit the deck and form a seal. Then you need to have a deck. This can be almost anything. The Swift Press is a solid piece of aluminum. Uh, the Swift Press I use in my shop, my production one, is one of the early prototypes, and it's a it's countertop. It's Corian. Um, you can use HDPE. You can use almost any non-permeable material. I don't recommend MDF or plywood. I've tried both of them. They're fairly porous. They will not hold a tight enough seal. Even like I used to, I sealed MDF and taped off my edges and still lost enough vacuum that I was not able to get the results that I wanted. So I don't recommend MDF. I don't recommend plywood. Um, you can probably buy a sheet of aluminum someplace. You might be able to buy or find a scrap piece of Corian countertop. Uh, this is a piece of Ren shape. It's a, a composite board. This is one inch thick stuff. Uh, it's it's solid. It's non-permeable. Ren shape would work fine. It's a little bit expensive, but if you find a piece of some kind of composite material, I, I believe the DIY Pro Press is made out of one of the lighter grades of Ren shape. Um, those of you who have just joined, I'm giving away another CNC machined HDPE mold. This is another copy of the 1911 railed five inch. It's got a very minor cosmetic blem on it, and I'm giving it away if you share the feed. So share this feed. And then at the end of the night, I will go through and look at the list of everybody who shared it, assign them all a number, go to random number generator, pick a number, and let the winner know in the post and also by message that they won and I'll get the shipping address and send them a mold. So if you want to be entered in to win the 1911 5-inch, share the feed. So basically, you have a deck and you have a frame. There are no rules about size and material, especially for the frame. Uh, this frame that I sell with the Swift Press is one by one inch aluminum extrusion. I get it from 80-20, I machine my own brackets, I assemble with quarter 20 bolts, very straightforward, simple hardware. Um, the reason I supply an aluminum adjustable frame is because I want the Swift Press out of the box to be able to scale to work efficiently with any size mold you want. The smaller you scale your frame down, the smaller pieces you put on the Swift Press at a time or on any non-membrane former at once, the less efficiency you have in the production process. Because um, if you can get multiple molds on the table, they share center edges and they don't have to have a gasketed piece of plastic at that edge. And so you distribute the waste around a larger perimeter and it's a, le it's a smaller bit, a smaller percentage of each holster goes away as waste. So you have to have a frame, you have to have a deck, the deck has to be non-permeable. The frame does not have to be adjustable. You can make a frame out of half inch by three quarter wood. Four pieces of this, screw them together at the corners, make a rectangle, it's a frame. You don't have to have the frame be adjustable. The frame can be out of plastic, it can be out of plywood, it can be out of metal. It can be out of almost anything you want as long as you can press it down around the mold and force the kydex to make contact with the deck. Uh, I've made frames out of plywood, I've made frames out of one by two hardwood. Uh, the only deal with the frame is it has to be rigid enough that when you press it down, it makes good contact all the way around. That's it. Just needs to lay flat and be strong enough that when you push on it, it doesn't get all wobbly and flex around on it. 
Jamie Lowe as, dude, look at all the people watching. You're getting to be famous. Yeah, 62, that's a new high for me. I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, if you have an impermeable deck, you have to have a way to connect it to your, to your vacuum source. I always recommend a Robinair 15800 8 CFM pump. And I always recommend plumbing directly from the pump to the former. I know a lot of guys are using the Swift Press or their own non-membrane former alongside an HD or a Garage Works or a BLT, a Thermopress, or some kind of hand-built membrane former um, with, with which they use a surge tank. Um, I don't like to use a surge tank with the Swift Press, and the reason is very simple. The Swift Press is about speed, and for the speed to work, I need to have immediate feedback. When I lay a sheet of plastic down and I drop my frame, if for some reason the seal doesn't form right away, for a few seconds I can still pull the frame off, pull the plastic, put it back in the heat press while it's still floppy enough to lay flat without getting creased when I close the, hint, close the lid, and I can heat it for 30 more seconds and go again. If I have to put the plastic down, then put the frame down, and then open a valve to engage my surge tank, if I don't have a seal, the surge tank gets wasted like that, and by the time the surge tank recharges to hit it again, the plastic is too cold. So the reason I like to use it plumb direct to the pump is, right before I pull my plastic out of the heat press, I turn my vacuum pump on, it's drawing vacuum, my mold is in place. Once I lay the plastic down and I drop the frame, if I have good contact all the way around, I get the instant feedback of the plastic vacuuming down like that. If for any reason, the plastic does not instantly suck down when I lay the frame, I know immediately, pull the frame, reheat the plastic, and while it's reheating, I try to troubleshoot and figure out why it didn't work and then go again, okay? So I like the simplest system possible. I did a video a couple weeks ago while John was here. I took an actual boxed up, fully packaged Swift Press that I was ready to send out, exactly as I would send it out. I opened it, I unpacked it, I got it plugged into the vacuum system, I got the frame scaled to my mold and set up in a minute and 50 seconds. It is an incredibly plug and play system. If you wanna build one yourself, it's gonna take more time, it's gonna be slower, but you can do it on a real budget. If you use wood and build your frame and you use a piece of HDPE plastic or some scrap countertop or something, uh, something else inexpensive or salvaged for your deck, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you could get the entire press assembled and going for under 50 bucks. Um, obviously, you'll have to have a heat source and you'll have to have a vacuum pump. When it comes to plumbing, uh, this aluminum deck is direct threaded. I have a Legrease half inch push to connect fitting threaded right into the deck. I actually tap this deck in my mill. If you want to use aluminum, and you're going to tap it yourself for a fitting, these are the fittings I recommend. This one's made by Jupiter Pneumatics. This one's made by Legrease. I get these both from MSC Direct. I wait till they have sales, and then I buy a bunch. Uh, this fitting's about three bucks. It's a straight fitting, non-swivel. Uh, this one is a swivel, so the head can spin around, which is nice. Uh, these guys are about seven and a half bucks. I have posted pictures of this along with the box with the part number on my Facebook page and my Instagram. You can go back and find that if you need it. Um, if you have a deck material that these can thread directly into, if you're using soft plastic like HDPE, you'll simply drill a hole and you'll get a wrench and you'll crank this in and it will self-tap the plastic. If you're using a harder material, you will have to get a tap and a handset and thread that hole manually. This is what that looks like for me. This is a half inch by 14 NPT tap. That's a big boy. Takes some work. Yes, NPT threads. These are all half inch by 14 NPT threads. Uh, that's the same as uh, male pipe thread. Um, so if you're gonna tap a deck, a rigid deck, some kind of tough material, you'll need a decent sized handle. You're not gonna get this done with a cheap little uh, chintzy tapping kit. Uh, this one's over 100 years old, thread well, really solid. Um, if you have a material like Corian, which is too brittle, and if you try to tap it, it'll crumble, then you can actually plumb in with a floor flange. One of these guys, one of these guys. Here's a bigger one, okay? These are also used to make like railings out of pipe and stuff. You can get this at any hardware store, Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, 
anybody will have this. You would simply take this and screw it or through bolt it to your deck and then put in whatever fittings you need. This one has a rigid elbow in it. You will need to put silicone around the floor flange before you screw it into your deck. Um, on my Corian deck, rather than drive screws in, it would actually drill the holes through it and put quarter 20 bolts down through the top, put a floor flange on the bottom and put nuts underneath and then put silicone on this, put it up into place and then silicone capped the head of all the bolts on top to make them airtight. Um, you don't have to have a vacuum gauge in this whole system. Really the only feedback is did you get full did you get immediate vacuum? And if you got good vacuum, you'll be able to see the difference in visible definition is pretty intense. Um, but if you want to put a vacuum gauge in line, here's how I do it. This is a nice fluid filled vacuum gauge, it's about 30 bucks on a T fitting with half inch push to connect fittings at each end, which means I can just quickly with, a, with this and an extra length of hose, just drop this in directly between my pump and my swift press. The important thing is not the absolute numerical reading on the dial. The important thing, the reason I use the gauge is to see that I'm consistently reaching the same amount of vacuum pressure from cycle to cycle to cycle. I don't necessarily trust that this vacuum gauge when it reads 26 is actually showing me that there are exactly 26 inches of mercury pulled on my press, but I know roughly where I hit every time and I will immediately see if I'm under. If I don't get a full seal, if it looks close, the plastic sealed down, but the definition is 100%, I can look at the vacuum gauge and see, okay, I'm like three or four low, I didn't get a good seal, something's, something's wrong. One of the most common reasons why I wouldn't get a seal is because of this stuff. You have to have something. This is breather mesh. If you have a mold and you put it down on your deck and you lay your kayaks over it and vacuum it down, you need to have through holes for vacuum. You don't have to have very many. I like to go a little bit overboard. I put a lot in. Some guys put way too many in. You really only need a couple on each, on major flat surfaces and inside pockets, like inside the trigger guard. Boy, this white mold is really not showing up. I'm gonna go grab a black machine mold so I can point some things out on there better. And then I'm gonna take just a second and scroll back through and look at some comments and see if there's anything major I need to hit before I move on. One second. I'm going to walk over there and read a few comments. Do, 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 do. Just came to say hi, says Bobby Jackson. Autocorrect fail. Yeah, you can glue a fitting in if you need to. Sam Cummins is here. Samuel James, here's your shout out. Haas Custom Holsters. Yeah, I had to order a half-inch NPT tap, Clark. I don't think you're going to find it commonly at a hardware store. It's a pretty large tap. Most places won't, won't do it, won't have it. Uh, do, 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 do. Are you selling them, those presses? Yes, Stephen. They are available at henryholsters.com. The code FAST40 for 40 bucks off is still active on the presses I have left in stock. Once this current batch of presses is gone, I'm going to be taking a break for a while from, uh, from making presses. Okay, looks like I've caught back up on most of the comments back there. Do you recommend marking the vacuum gauge with the common reading you're getting for a proper seal? You can. You don't have to. It's, it's pretty accessible. You, you can pretty easily remember where you usually hit. But if you want to take a marker and put a quick mark on your vacuum gauge so you have a reference point that that's where you usually end up, what I was saying, and the reason I grabbed this black mold is you can see the surface a little bit better. Uh, you need vacuum holes on a few key surfaces. I put some, I usually put one or two inside the trigger guard pocket, one or two in the sight channel, a couple around the perimeter of the shape of the gun on the flat, and then any place I have blocking on top, I'll usually put one or two very small ones, 16th of an inch holes in and around there to make sure that air does not get trapped and pocket on top of the mold. But 
Once the air goes down through those holes, it has to have a way to travel underneath the mold and get to the central vacuum port um, in your deck. Uh, if your mold is off and is not over your vacuum port, obviously nothing works. You gotta keep your mold, I like to keep my molds roughly centered over my vacuum port, but you have to have something underneath the mold that's permeable to prevent the mold from locking out on the deck and preventing the air from traveling through. So, uh, in vacuum veneering and woodworking, there's a product called Breather Mesh. It is basically just a simple, thin, 3D plastic mesh with a grid of over and under lines so that it can't smush flat on a surface. Um, guys have also used window screens. Some guys use Scotch-Brite pads. Um, you can do that. I don't like Scotch-Brite or window screen. Window screen primarily because it's basically a 2D grid of interlapping uh, lines. It's not designed to be a 3D shape. This is specifically built so that even when it's under pressure, air can pass through it. Uh, I buy this from veneersupplies.com. It comes in two thicknesses, 20 thou and 60 thou thick. I get the 60 thou thick. I buy it in big rolls. Like, I don't know, last time I bought like 240 feet of it, something ridiculous, like multiple boxes of rolls. Um, but I always cut down a piece just smaller than my mold so it fits inside the perimeter of the mold or just to the edge. One of the things that can cause you to get a poor seal, if you have breather mesh under your mold and when you go to actually press, if the breather mesh sneaks out beyond the edge like that, you know, say it gets misaligned and sticks out out here. When you lay your codex down, if that breather mesh is out underneath your frame and can still vent to the outside under your codex, you won't get a good seal. So it's okay for the breather mesh to not come all the way out to the edges of your mold. I always cut it a little bit undersized. And then sometimes I will throw a tab or two of tape on the underside of the mold so the breather mesh can't easily shift out from under there and cause me problems. But sometimes I'm in a hurry and don't prep fully, and every once in a while the breather mesh shifts, or when I'm getting ready to lay the frame down, I bump the mold off center and it's off the mesh partially and the mesh is sticking out, and then I have a problem. So with every kind of forming, prep is key. If you prep well, if you plan ahead, things go smoothly. If you don't, they tend to not go as smoothly. So I cover a deck, it needs to be impermeable. You can make it out of plastic, you can make it out of metal. Uh, I don't recommend hardwood, even if you could get a piece the right size, wood has, um, xylem and phloem in it. It's got, wood is not airtight. Um, you can seal it. You could, you could urethane it. You could shellac it. You could do something to try to close those pores up, but it's so much easier to just buy a, an engineered material. Just buy some plastic and use it. Jace Powell is here. Um, since some guys are still just joining, I am giving away a 1911 five inch rail HDPE mold. If you want to be entered in the running for the drawing for this at the end of the broadcast, share the feed and I will go through at the end and draw a name a number from the guys who shared the feed and then send somebody a free mold. I have one more of those. So there will be another Facebook Live broadcast before Christmas where I will be giving away a 1911 mold. Uh, so those are the basic things. Now about the theory of why membrane, non-membrane forming is good and how I use it and how I think you should use it in your shop. So it's all about speed. I've done an entire Facebook Live broadcast about speed. I could talk about speed for days. And when I look at uh, pictures and videos from other holster makers' shops and see their questions, it often appears to me that guys are not thinking about speed appropriately. In this kind of production, speed is one of the key metrics to being financially successful. You have to be able to get the product done quickly. So an example would be, guys are concerned about the plastic waste, and they're currently using an HD former, which is a very good tool, and for certain kinds of holsters, it's the only way to do it. A swift press is not good. A non-memory former is not good for curved jig work. Uh, it's usually not as forgiving for custom prints. There are some things where an HD former is a better option than a non-membrane former, but... If you're just doing standard stuff, black, gray, coyote, whatever, and you're concerned about the material waste on a non-membrane former, and throughout the course of this broadcast, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna refer to non-membrane formers as a swift press, as it's easier for me than to say non-membrane former every time. 
Um, so on a swift press, what you're doing is you're trading material and getting back cooling time. So on my BLT former or on an HD, you usually have several minutes of time after you close the lid and engage the surge pump, surge tank, when the plastic is still hot, the silicone membrane is insulating it and keeping it hotter for longer. And you have to let it sit there under vacuum while it slowly cools. That's the major reason um, why I liked having a surge tank on my system. It was not so much for the initial hit of vacuum, although it helps if you have a low CFM pump to have that reserve of vacuum stored up. The biggest reason is once I close my press, I don't have to keep the pump running continually. The surge tank will absorb any small amount of leakage I have around the perimeter of the lid and will keep the vacuum pressure high and then occasionally kick the pump back on. You can have an automated pressure switch that cycles your pump if the pressure drops too low. I know HD sells that. But by going to a swift press, what you're gaining is cooling time. I usually have stuff cool enough to take off the press about 25 seconds to 30 seconds after I pull it out of the heat press. If I'm giving away, if I'm giving away one dollar worth of extra material per holster and I'm gaining three to four minutes by having the cooling time be so fast, if I do, you say I'm, say I'm gaining four minutes, okay, how much plastic I'm trying to think how to say this. An hour of saved time costs me $15 in plastic. An hour of saved time would cost me $15 of wasted plastic if I were losing a dollar of plastic per holster and saving four minutes in the forming process. Here's the question. If I had an extra hour, could I make more than $15 more worth of product? Easily, easily. The number of holsters I can form in an hour is crazy, okay? I could probably do 20 or 30 more holsters comfortably in that period of time. $15, $15 is nothing. It's crazy to give up that much speed to try to preserve such a small dollar amount of plastic. I've been seeing a bunch of comments roll by. I'm gonna walk over here and take a quick look. Not sure if people are agreeing with me or disagreeing with me. What's the state of the union? Rob Bully says, shared. Thanks from RPS Tactical for your time and info. Whoa, this guy. I've never wanted five inches so bad in my life. It's all about speed. Hot, nasty speed. Who won the last mold giveaway, Kyle Dean? Jeremy Gibbs. Uh, Jeremy Gibbs from Pagan Ridge Tactical won it. Nelson Maldonado is here. Chris Johnson. Laminate countertop probably should work. You'll have to test it. Uh, it may be a little bit permeable, but if it's particle board, it's probably a pretty thick, solid concoction of wood chips and glue. Got mine a veneer. It's worth buying. Hot glue by mesh. Yeah, you can, you can screw breather mesh to the underside of the mold. You can hot glue it in place. I like using aluminum foil tape and just tabbing it around the edges. It's pretty durable. Um... Anybody who has joined since the last time I announced it, I am giving. Really? Makes me think my mic isn't hooked up. Let's double check this. Let's see if the mic is. Oh. Goodness. How about now? I bet my mic is plugged in now. When I stepped back, I must have caught it on something and partially pulled it out. So I think the mic is live now. I apologize for the poor audio quality. Hopefully it's working better. I'm not even drinking coffee and I'm all hyped up. Um, what else? This guy, infrared thermometer. Every holster maker should have one. You can experiment more realistically with your time and temperature recipes when you're using a non-membrane former because when you pull it out and you temp check on your mold, you're actually scanning the kydex. You're not trying to scan through a membrane and you're not having to do waste or test pieces that you heat and then just drop on the bench and scan. You can actually have the thermometer ready, pull plastic, drop on your mold, drop the frame, have the vacuum engage, and then instantly temp check it and see what temperature you're at when you actually form it because that's the temperature that matters. 
the temperature you have the press set at and the temperature the plastic is at the instant you pull it out of the heat press is not the important part. The important part is what temperature is it at when you actually shape it. Because if you take too long, if you're just sort of wandering around from the heat press to your former, and I see this a lot, I'm still amazed sometimes when I see videos on Instagram of guys taking plastic out and setting it down and letting go of it and then straightening it and letting go of it and then straightening it and then 12 to 13 seconds after they first open the heat press, then they finally close the lid and engage their vacuum. It's crazy. Go as fast as possible. I try to be from the heat press onto the mold and under full vacuum in under six seconds every time. That's always the metric I'm shooting for. And I'm a little bit crazy, so I'll often count that in my head, you know, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand. And if I can't get it in under six, I'm off my game. So you have to have, have a frame, you have to have an impermeable deck, you have to have plumbing connectors. Some guys are using uh, hose barbs and reinforced braided clear line. Some guys, I've seen some guys using flare gas fittings, like the kind you'd use to hook up a gas stove. Um, I've seen some guys using um, like compressed air, a little quarter inch collet setting uh, fittings. Um, Understand that you want to maximize your diameter. You want to plumb with whatever the largest internal diameter piping you can use is. Um, I like to use half inch OD vacuum rated line. It's easy to get. The fittings are pretty accessible. They're not terribly expensive. I could go bigger, but then I'd have to get an enormous tap to tap the center hole in my decks. And for me, that wouldn't really be worth it. And the vacuum line run from my pump to my press is so short. It's like 16 inches of hose to get from my press to my pump. And so there's so little air volume involved um, that it's working really well as is. If I went down to a smaller line, like a quarter inch OD, I'd be making my pump try to suck that air through a really tiny straw. And that would not work as well. So... If you're thinking about getting into non-membrane forming, it will be harder on your molds. If you're using hand-built molds and you've hodgepodge things together out of split blue guns or you split multi-molds or you split DIY drones or you've bought split boards or split molds from any of those companies and you have glued or taped or screwed blocking onto them, you are going to find that the Swift Press non-membrane forming process is a lot harder on your molds. The reason it's harder on your molds is because the plastic will pull down much more tightly on all the vertical surfaces of your mold and will tend to bite under the edges of your blocking and be much more likely to rip it off when you go to demold the shell after you've cooled it down. Let's see. Can't tell. I think the audio got fixed. John was certainly right. The, uh, the mic jack had popped loose. Much better, says Conrad. Swipe left to reveal comments. Audio's cutting out a lot. Did you experience the aluminum deck chill in the Caddx faster than your Corian deck? Asks Todd May. Uh, no, Todd, I didn't because usually after, uh, after the first cycle, well, first, the, I'm always using molds that have the backer actually machined in around the mold. So when I press a holster, like say this is a Glock 42, no part of the finished holster is actually touching the aluminum. The whole finished holster shell is cut out of the area that rests on top of this mold. So I haven't had an issue with the temperature of the aluminum in my shop affecting the final product because the final product doesn't actually touch the aluminum. You could hear me when the mic was unplugged. That's good. Wasn't that bad, says Jamie Lowe. I got you, fam, says John. Thanks. Yeah, plugged in now. Um, yeah, hopefully. I get, there's so many things to try to keep track of that I just can't keep track of at all. So, I uh, haven't seen any new questions come through in a minute that I need to answer, so I'm just going to keep rolling. I talked about breather mesh. I told you where to get it. You can use Scotch-Brite. You can use Screen. If that's just a hasty solution for now, I recommend actually buying some breather mesh. It's not very expensive. Um, 
if you buy a Swift press and you get the adjustable metal frame and you're constantly doing a bunch of projects of different sizes, it can be worth building yourself several non-adjustable frames just so that you have some stock sizes that you never have to mess with. Because if you're going back and forth and back and forth and changing molds on and off the press, you don't want to constantly be having to loosen these brackets and scale the frame. So I do this too. I have some non-adjustable frames that I've built because there are certain parts that I run on the Swift press every month and they're always the same size. The molds never change. And so I can very cheaply and easily build out of wood a rigid non-adjustable frame that's perfectly sized for that project. And just whenever I'm not using it, just hang it up on the wall. Um, so if you're going to get into non-membrane forming, you are going to have to be okay with wasting material in the learning process. And you're going to have to be okay with it being harder on your molds. Um, if you're not seeing results that look significantly better than what you're getting off a membrane former, then you've not reached the full potential of the process. Either you're underheating your plastic or you're handling it too long after you take it out before you vacuum it down, or you're not getting a full seal, or it's possible your vacuum system is leaky, your pump is under oiled, some other thing is affecting the peak temp vacuum pressure you're reaching, you're not getting all the way there. You should see results that are instantly, obviously better in terms of the clarity and, the, and the, uh, the, the definition of the part. The plastic will conform to your mold more tightly on a swift press or non-membrane former than on a membrane former. I know some guys uh, cheat, sort of, and use an oversized piece of plastic on a membrane former to duplicate a non-membrane result. That's fine. It's non-membrane forming. They just happen to be doing it on a membrane equipped former. Uh, so you can use almost any material as long as it doesn't leak. If you're not sure if it's going to leak or not, just drill a hole in the deck and put a fitting in, attach it to your pump and try it. If you're using scrapped or salvaged materials, all you're losing is a little bit of time and you stand to gain so much by experimenting with this and seeing what it can do for you. Um, I really like to use a Swift press to do multiple copies of the same thing every cycle. I try to put four molds on at a time whenever I can. Or try to put, you know, sometimes I have some molds that actually have two copies of a part. If I'm doing magazine carriers or AR mags, something that's smaller, the initial mold will actually be a double carrier mold. So I'll put two of those on and get four parts per press cycle. And that's one of the areas where this will really speed things up for you. If you start getting into CNC machine molds, and you can get multiple molds that are completely identical with the blocking built in, the retention adjusted just right, everything done so there's no tape, no epoxy, no screws, no glue, nothing that can break down, shift off position, or pull loose of the mold. If you've got a monolithic mold with everything into it, then you can put that on your Swift press, you can get multiple copies of that mold machined, you can fill up your Swift press table, use as large a piece of plastic as your heat press can handle, and then get two or four hoist, full, two or four holsters every press cycle, and cool all four of them in 25 to 30 seconds and get them off and get the next set of stuff on. The speed is really incredible. And once you've seen it up close, um, other styles of vacuum forming start to feel kind of like watching paint dry. So uh, that's my basic intro to uh, how to build your own non-membrane former, your own thrift press. Um, if you don't have salvage materials and you're going to buy something to put it together, I would recommend buying a piece of one inch thick HDPE. I think you can get it on Amazon. Uh, Almost any of the guys in the holster field who are doing CNC machine mold work, um, we all have HDPE in stock. If you're local to one of those guys, if you're near Conrad or you're near me or you're near Clark, uh, just hit one of those guys up and you know maybe ask them to cut you a piece. Uh, if I was building a budget thrift press, non-membrane former, I'd probably start with a deck that was around 12 by 12 inches. A small, simple, straightforward one that's not going to take up a lot of space in your shop that will allow you to form one holster at a time and just get the feel for the process. Once you've got the feel of the process, you see how it works, you get comfortable with the new workflow, then consider building or buying a bigger one as you have need of it. Um, 
The reason the Swift Press is the size that it is, is because I wanted something that was size competitive with the HD 200, but I also had some size limitations on my CNC mill. Um, I didn't have room to fixture a plate that was much larger than 15 by 20 and still be able to access all four sides of it without it hanging off the table. So if I'm gonna release a bigger Swift Press, I'm gonna have to get a bigger mill. I guess I could do that, but it's not really in the budget at the moment. Um, the other limiting factor is heat sources. I know Bobby Jackson recently got a ridiculously large heat press from China, uh, but the standard ones that are on the market for t-shirt work tend to be 16 by 20 or 16 by 24. And because you need a few inches of hot plastic larger than your molds are in order to get that seal on the deck, uh, if you can only heat a 16 inch wide piece, if 16 is your max plastic heated width, then you don't actually have 16 inches of usable forming area. You maybe have 14 or 13 and a half that can actually be taken up by molds and still leave enough deck free to get the plastic onto, have enough plastic to get down to the deck and form a good seal. So uh, that's going to be pretty much it. That's everything I laid out on the table for tonight. Uh, one last shot at the, the 1911 five inch railed HTPE mold. I'll be giving it away to whoever I draw via random number, number generator from the guys who shared this feed. So even now at the end, in the last few minutes, if you've just joined up or you didn't share the feed yet, but you want to now, as long as you share the feed before the broadcast ends, you are in the running for the mold. If you share the feed tomorrow, I will be grateful and you will win nothing. Uh, what else? Frame, deck, fittings, vacuum line, non-adjustable frames, molds, heating. Uh, you can use a membrane former. You don't have to have trim jigs. Trim jigs are really nice. If you have multiple copies of your forming mold made, you have a CNC machine mold and get multiple copies of it made so you can go fast in the forming process. Trim molds are a really nice next step to then start buying back time in the shaping process and increase the consistency and lower the rejection rate. You're never going to uh, accidentally bandsaw way inside the line if you're bandsawing rough outside the line and then trimming to your final shape with a trim router. Um, so some guys have hand built their own trim molds. I sell trim molds. Conrad Miller sells trim molds. And then a lot of guys are getting into CNC trimming their parts on small machines like the X-Car, the CNC Shark, the Shapoco. Uh, some guys have gotten into more serious machines like Shop Saber and Cam Master, although the Shop Saber guys seem to have been having trouble with their machines, which I'm sorry about. Bummer. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. It's been a very long day in the shop for me. I've been prototyping some new things, a new AR mag carrier design, uh, working on some molds, been making other holster shells for more holster shells for Filster, and doing a bunch of CAD work and getting ready to machine some more aluminum parts. Oh, this is fun. Let me grab something that just came. UPS delivered me a new toy right before this broadcast started. My UPS guy is showing up around 8.30 at night because it's holiday hours. Check out this new cutter for my CNC. That's a three inch high speed for aluminum shear hog. That thing is a beast. And I can't wait to just make blocks of aluminum cry in my mill with that bad boy. So once I sign off this broadcast, I'm gonna be throwing that up in the mill and uh, loading it into my tool library, touching it off for length and then cutting a test part or two. So almost, almost 90. When using multiple molds on the Swift Press at once, do you use one giant piece of mesh? Yes, Ryan, I do. I try to use a single piece of mesh that fits under all the molds. Material source for the breather mesh, Nicholas Pratt. I buy mine from veneersupplies.com online. 
using multiple modes. Shared three times, is that worth anything? <laughs> Snap, says Chris. I almost missed the giveaway chance. Well, almost missed it. Outstanding, says Alvin. Thank you, Alvin. Vacuum reservoir tank is good. Oh, this is, I'm not done yet. A few other things to mention. I'm going to pull my chair up and have a seat because I'm getting low on energy. Let me drop this down a little bit. I'll talk a little bit more about surge tanks and then about trying to use multiple presses. So uh, I don't think surge tanks are especially useful with a swift press. And I explained earlier it's because I want the immediate feedback of the vacuum, the vacuum line being open when I lay my plastic so that when it hits the deck, if I have a good seal all the way around, the plastic instantly forms and I have that as a reference to tell me that yes, I did get a good seal, I've got good contact, the holster instantly formed. I'm ready to cool it. As soon as it forms, I just start cooling. I don't have to wait. It just, once it engages, the vacuum hits, the plastic pulls down, I start cooling with compressed air. I think it was Nicholas Pratt, although it may have been somebody else, uh, last week asked on one of the Facebook Codex groups about trying to run, uh, start trying to set up a plumbing system to run two non-membrane formers side by side. And there was some discussion about it. I actually encouraged him not to even bother trying to do that. And the main reason why not to do that is because the forming and cooling cycle is so fast that as an operator, I would not have time to manage a second press. One press keeps me perfectly busy. The other thing is because the cooling time is so short, you do not have a window of time where plastic is sitting cooling under vacuum and just sitting there for a while. After about 30 seconds, when the plastic cools enough around the edge, the vacuum seal breaks. And that's with the pump in constant engagement. If you lay your plastic down and lay your frame down and then turn the pump off, the vacuum seal will break very quickly. And so I keep the pump running for most of that 25 seconds while I'm cooling the part. This means I'm running the pump for a longer stretch right at that time than guys who are using the surge tank. They might pre-vacuum the whole surge and then you know, only run the pump for a few seconds when they're forming in order to get the surge back up to full pressure after the initial hit and then they turn the pump off. I like to just leave my pump running while I'm cooling and while I'm cooling, when the plastic gets cool enough that the vacuum seal breaks, then I know it's cool enough to take off the press. So I'd lay it down, lay my frame, the plastic forms, I start cooling, my vacuum pump is still running, I keep cooling, I keep cooling, I keep cooling with the vac pump still running. Then when the seal breaks, because the plastic has hardened up enough that it's no longer elastic and clinging to the deck, I hear the sound of the pump change, I know the seal broke, that's when I know it's cool enough to take off the deck and get ready for the next thing. Scroll up through some comments. I'm not doing it. Um, and so I'm pretty busy. I've seen shops set up two employees running two stations on one pump and involve valves and wasted time and a hectic workflow, says John Hopman. Do I recommend HDP or aluminum molds, or do you even notice the difference in mold life? Yeah, Orion, the difference is really there. Aluminum molds are impervious to the forming temperatures we're using, and they're phenomenal but they're also more expensive to make and they're harder for the end user to modify. The big advantage of HDPE molds is that the cost of entry is cheap, under a hundred bucks for a machine mold, and you can easily drill it yourself. You can easily screw blocking onto it yourself. You can tape stuff to it. You can cut it with a bandsaw if you need to reshape it. You can make your own trim mold out of an HDPE mold. You can't do that effectively with aluminum. Aluminum is much more durable, and the downside is it's also much more durable and less friendly for hand work. Steven Oliveira, Oliveira uh, you can't use full molds with this process. The Swift Press is, well, I've never bothered trying to put, no, that's not true. I did bother a long time ago. Trying to put foam, breather mesh, then foam, then a mold, and plastic, then a mold, then more plastic and seal it. It doesn't work. Non-membrane forming, Swift Press forming is for split molds only. Um, K 
Cook says, let me win that mold. Well, you're entered as long as you shared it. Um, that is a big cutter. That thing is going to be awesome. Other questions. When I grew up, can I be like you? I don't know. Anson Miller, maybe. Mick says I'm breaking up and cutting in and out just for you because I don't like you, Mick Tucker. No idea. I mean, I'm out in my shop. The internet connection is spotty sometimes. Um, so if you want to try to scale this process, if you find that one guy with one pump, one heat press, and one swift press is not enough to produce all the shells you need, first of all, congrats. You've got bomber sales if you've got that much demand that one guy can't keep up because a swift press can produce a lot of shells in a week. Um, but if you decide you want to scale it, then the easiest way to scale it is just to duplicate the whole workstation. It's another heat press, another vac pump, another swift press, and a second operator. That way the two are completely independent. They can be running different temperature recipes for different plastics. They can be completely independent of each other and not stepping on each other's toes. Anytime you share parts, you share equipment, in a workflow, you will always end up with some guy stepping on each other's toes in terms of time in the workflow. Uh, setting up a second operator station with a full set of equipment is not that expensive if it buys you double the productivity and no lost time due to overlap of needs on the same machine. Um, so if you want to try to scale it, I say just duplicate the whole setup, have a second operator running a completely independent setup, and have them go to town. I used to also form molds from real guns, but had to put a spacer around the pistol. Uh, you can, yes, you can use, um, you can use a whole gun if you want to make a single-sided shell, if you're making hybrid shells, or something where you're going to put some kind of blocking around the gun and form um, down to that and not all the way down to the deck. The trade-off is that Guns don't typically have real flat sides. Levers and buttons and latches and switches and things get in the way. And on a hard surface, the gun will not always necessarily lay flat in the orientation you want. So you can shim it. You can play with it. I suppose, theoretically, if you're making hybrid holsters, um, you could try to use a whole gun with shims around it and under it to level it. But it's just, it's just not worth it. Just get a split mold. Just get a split mold. Um, modular molds. I talked about modularity in my last Facebook Live talk, but I saw it come up again in a discussion uh, yesterday or today. Or oh, maybe it was a DM. I forget. I, I read a lot of stuff, and people text me and DM me all the time, so I get things muddled. Um, oh, somebody was asking about using uh, split molds. I don't know if they were talking about uh, Jason Cook's molds or multi-molds or DIYs. Anyway, they were thinking about trying to drill some indexing holes in the back and have the mold halves be able to be swapped onto an outside the waistband backer or a little board for inside the waistband holsters. And I'm really a big fan of dedicated molds. If you have one holster design, build a dedicated mold and then leave it alone. Don't try to have all your parts be interchangeable. Every time you take one mold assembly apart, and build it into a second mold assembly, you are risking messing it up. You're risking breaking the mold, you're risking dropping the mold, you're mis risking misaligning the mold, and then you can never have multiple things on the press at once if everything is based on one modular mold half and you've only got one body of the mold and you're just moving it around from setup to setup. So pay the time and money up front, get a dedicated mold for each holster design you want to make, and then go to town on them. If you're going to make inside the waistbands and outside the waistbands, buy two split molds, set up one permanently for inside, one permanently for outside, and leave them alone. The time you will waste going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth every time you have to change. In the first month or two, you will have already wasted more time, more money. Um, I think it was Henry Ford. This was a great quote. I saw it again a few weeks ago. He said, if you need a machine and you don't buy it, later on you will find that you have paid for it and don't have it. 
And that's totally true. Hey, Nate Gallup, since you just joined, I'm giving away a 1911 mold again tonight. Facebook Live giveaway. So if you want to be entered into the drawing to win the 1911 HDPE machined mold, share the feed and you will be entered in the drawing. Um, so dedicated molds. Spend the time to get it right and then leave it alone. Spend the time to make it durable, permanent, accurate, and then leave it alone. Yeah, Nate Gallup, I said your name. You're famous up in here. Share it, Jeremy Gill, says Gary Gonzalez. Yeah, Jeremy Gill, share it. Um, so I think I'm all in favor of guys going out and on the tightest budget possible, building themselves a small, single-station thrift press, non-membrane former. Great. Fantastic. And the reason I think it's so good, the reason I'm excited about it, the reason I sat down to do this video and tell you everything I can think of about this style of press and how to use it, even though I'm selling it and in a way I'm undercutting my own market, the reason I'm doing it is because as more of you guys use this kind of former, more of you will be in the market for CNC molds. More of you will see the value there and more of you will have the production efficiency that can actually benefit from those molds. So I'm trying to push the industry forward. The way I'm pushing it forward is by pushing a new forming technique for a lot of guys. And I think it's going to benefit everybody. 30 by 48, says Rick, and I can't use the whole thing. What molds do you suggest for making outside the waistband on the Swift Press? Well, I make outside the waistband holsters with dedicated CNC machined outside the waistband molds where the gun half and the wing angles and the drill points, everything are all machined into a shingle shape. Those get pretty expensive. Um, so unless you're moving significant volume, unless you're moving significant volume, uh, CNC machined outside the waistband molds are probably not a good investment for you yet. A good intermediate step, um, a good intermediate step is to get some angle backers from red eye concealment. He designed them. I actually did the CAD work and then I machined them. Um, it's a way for you to take any current split mold. You could use Jason Cook's molds, QLH. You could use multi-mold split halves, butterfly molds, but not split boards. You could use DIY split molds. You can split your own blue guns. Um, and then affix those to the outside the waistband mold backer and basically get in a single press the gun and the integrated angled wings all at once you'll you'll really want to um you'll really want to cut the backers down to the minimum possible size that still gives you your final holster shape just because oversized molds don't usually penalize you on a membrane former but they penalize you like crazy on a swift press uh let me explain um i'm surprised I don't think he's here, but I know a lot of you guys use them like Jason Cook's molds. And Jason seems like a great guy, and the molds are awesome. But I'm still surprised that he forms them with the complete grip of the gun included in the mold. No holster maker needs that. He's wasting resin, and it's making it bigger to pack. And, you know, most holster makers, when they get that, um, they just don't need it. There's no reason for the full grip of the gun to be there. If you're using an HD former and you've got a small square of plastic just big enough for your holster and the grips of the mold are hanging out outside that edge, it doesn't impact you at all. It has no effect except that it makes it harder to nest multiple molds tightly in the former because the grips stick out and they bump into each other and they get in the way. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you being here. Um, if you're trying to use a Swift press and your plastic has to go beyond whatever the farthest points of the mold are, and then wrap over them down to the deck. If you leave the grips on, you're really going to pay with extra plastic. He'll cut them if you ask, says Dean. Okay, good, good. Um, if you're going to use a Swift press, though, you are always going to want to, on every mold you use, cut away extraneous material. I'm going to grab one of my one of my machine molds and show you what I mean. 
because on my HDPE testers, I still take mine to the bandsaw and cut them down sometimes so I can nest them more tightly. Sit tight, I'm gonna grab a pair of molds and show you exactly what I mean. On a Swift, you want the shape of the mold to be as close to the final size of the holster as possible, says John. Yeah, that's basically it. So if I wanted to put two molds on a Swift press, there are three ways I can align them. I can align them muzzle to muzzle. I can align them side to side. And I can al align them sweat guard to sweat guard. Those are the only three options. Here's the thing. On each of these molds, assuming I'm making a right-handed holster, say I've got some clip blocking here, I'm using a strut. For most holster makers, the area from here up is dead space. It's not going to be used in the final holster shell. Okay? But it's still there in the mold, and it's got to be covered by the plastic, and it's taking up space on the table. What if I took my mold, and I just bandsawed that section out? Well... I can still align them muzzle to muzzle. I can still align them side to side, but if I've bandsawed those sections out on my HDPE molds and I align them sweat guard to sweat guard, they're now overlapping on this center section and the overall width of my mold pack has just got a lot smaller. And I haven't affected the function of my final holster shape at all. I've still got all the forming area I need to make the holster shape I've just managed to get rid of all this wasted area and all that wasted area. And every time I press this pair of molds, I'm saving that material back. Okay? That amount of space, you know, just that chunk of plastic, that size of plastic right there, is not an insignificant number of square inches. It adds up. Okay, over time, and so that cuts down on the amount of waste I'm producing every time I use these molds. This is easy to do with HDPE molds. I'm not going to take aluminum molds to the bandsaw and cut them like this. Um, so with my aluminum molds, I sometimes machine my molds into an optimized shape that has the narrowest possible width out here and is just a tiny bit longer than the final muzzle of the holster and has all this excess material removed so that I can nest the aluminum molds as tightly as possible. But a real quick and easy hack, is there a safety guard on the holster to prevent someone from grabbing your own weapon? CJ Lubrin asks. Uh, CJ, if you're asking if there is active retention, a snap or a bail or a latch of some kind, no, there's not. These holsters are level one retention. It is a molded fit. The gun clicks into place. The plastic holds it. But there is no mechanical mechanism to prevent somebody from taking it away from you. All the holsters that I make are designed for concealed carry. Um, it's more common to see active retention on duty holsters and open carry holsters, ones that are designed to be worn in such a way that they can be clearly seen the whole time. And those guns are always at a higher risk of being grabbed and taken away because other people can see them before the fight gets started. So uh, if you have HDPE molds and you're putting them on a press, uh, a swift press, a thrift press, a non-membrane former, consider cutting them like this and trying to optimize. I think the most efficient way to nest the molds for most right or left-handed setups if you're doing an ambi setup with low cut sweat guards on both sides, then muzzle to muzzle or slide to slide doesn't really matter. But if you're doing, um, if you're doing right-handed or left-handed holsters, get two molds, set them up as a pair, trim away the excess, nest them this way. You're welcome. Uh, yep, that's pretty much it for info from me. Thank you, Russell. I appreciate you being here. 
Thank you guys for showing up. Oh, I've got 98 people. I'm just, oh, 97 people. I don't think I've ever hit 100 viewers at one time. That would be a new benchmark for me. So what I'm going to do while I'm here, ask you guys for one more favor. If just a few more of you could share the feed and get a couple people to click through, then I will hit my 100 viewers, which has never happened before, which would be totally fun for me. Uh, and while I'm waiting for you generous folk to share it, I'll just remind everybody one more time. If you're a holster maker, I am giving away a 1911 five inch railed HDPE mold. Um, if you share the feed tonight while it's still live, while I'm still here talking, you will enter in the drawing for this. They're running out. I'll buy eight molds from you. Best way to reach you. Email Orion is the best way to reach me. And Orion, I will warn you, my molds are expensive. These guys are under a hundred bucks per mold. My custom molds are over $1,000 per mold. So that's what they're going for. Jimmy says, thanks for the information. You're welcome. James Silky says, word. James, you know what I say to you? I say word. Um, what else is going on? It's almost Christmas. 2016 has been an amazing year. Hello, Landon. 2016 has been an amazing year. Um, there are some really cool things coming down the pike for early 2017. Clark Trost is here, and Greg Wilson just shared it. Man, a lot of shares. I love it. Um, I know a number of companies are working on hardware hazmat holsters. Keith, uh, Keith Freeman just dropped a new loop of some kind today. I haven't seen it. I, I asked for samples, so I'm getting some soon. Um, I'm working on a modular ambidextrous uh, wing claw feature like the VG2. Uh, that's going to be hopefully available very early 2017. Um, it comes in a standard and a light bearing narrow version. So guys who want to put it on an XC1 holster or an X300 holster, um, there's a narrow version that will work well for that. I know a lot of guys have seen <clears throat> and commented on the machined wings that I make for Jeremy at Guncraft. Um, John Hotman has got some really cool hardware coming that I was privileged to also be able to do some design work on and help with. Where can I get the files for a CNC machine so I can make my own HDPE split molds? This is on point. Uh, on point, you're going to need to build them yourself. I don't sell files, and I don't know if anybody else sells files. You may be able to get some other holster maker to give you files. I don't sell mine. I only make molds. Cook says, so about that HDPE base plate for the thrift press. Dollars. Well, it depends on how much, how big you want it to be. A 12 by 12 inch piece of H of one inch thick HDPE is not very expensive. Um, yes, please don't have to waste more money on RCS claws, dude. I am so wanting to um, make the VG2 claw thing of the past. I've got no personal beef with RCS. But I would love to see a better option, a more modular, more adjustable option that also doesn't put their brand on all of your holsters. I think that's kind of crazy. Um, so, yeah, there's some really cool new hardware options coming in early 2017. Uh, I'm working on some things that are taking me beyond vacuum forming, which is really fun. Um, <clears throat> don't ask me. I'm not sharing files, says Clark. Um, yeah, the re the reason that asking for files is kind of a big deal is because almost all the time and energy goes into the files, not into the machining of the parts. So I've got a really high speed mill. It does not take me very long to make an HTPE or even make an aluminum mold, but it takes me a long time to do all the test iterations and verify the mold and make test copies and do all this stuff to make sure that the final copy of the mold is good. 42 bucks on Amazon for 12 by 24 by one. There's your answer. 42 bucks will get you a one by two foot forming area. You can split that cost with a buddy and each of you get a 12 by 12 inch former that'll do one mold at a time. Or you can really do, you can buy the 12 by 24 piece and do two molds side by side or flip them and nest them sweat guard to sweat guard if you trim them and optimize them like you should. Um, well, we got really close to 100 viewers, guys. I appreciate the effort. Oh, Mick Tucker just shared. Maybe Mick Tucker's share will be what puts me over the top. Uh, other things. Oh, if you want to do adjustable frames, 
Uh, Bosch makes extrusion. I use one by one inch extrusions from 8020 ink. You can also find scratch and dent 8020 stuff on eBay. They have an eBay store. Um, the reason I buy from them direct and don't buy scratch and dent stuff is because I'm selling it, uh, but also because it's easier for, uh, for me to get a whole batch with the Swift Press frames cut on a cold saw by them and just shipped to me already at the proper length um, so that I don't have to spend time cutting those and then milling the ends to clean them up. But there are, you can use aluminum T-track, the kind you would put in a router table. Uh, there's all kinds of options. You can go to Menards or Lowe's or Home Depot and very inexpensively pick up material that allows you to make uh, an adjustable frame. Uh, I even made an, a, a sort of adjustable wood frame. You can put threaded inserts in wood and use metal L corner brackets on top. And then you can just, you know, pull two screws at each corner and then slide the frame to a different set of inserts or just drill holes and just drive screws. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. It doesn't have to be super complicated. As long as it works, it's fine. There are no rules about it. Um, so go with whatever works for you. Some guys are saying, ah, non-membrane forming is not for me. It's too wasteful. I don't have the volume. Um, 8020 is awesome, says Dale Briggs. Hello, David. David Milhall just joined. I don't know if you saw this. I'm giving away a 1911 mold at the end of the broadcast tonight. So if you want to be entered in for the drawing, share the feed. Um, oh, what was I going to say? It was about... Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, some guys say non-membrane forming is not for me. I just can't absorb that waste. I don't have the sales. And here's a, an overall general thing I think about when I look at all the holster companies that I interact with on the forums, on Instagram, on Facebook, is that... Almost everybody is in the field of production. Everybody's working on production. Everyone's trying to save money, save time, increase quality on production. Hey, Jason Cook, I was talking about your molds earlier. I really like them. I'm still surprised, though, that you even offer anybody the option of having the mold with the full grip included. I would think that just for your material cost, it'd be better to just have the grips docked on every single mold. But, you know, if it makes more sense from your process, knowing it at your end, that's cool. But I've been impressed by the quality of the molds I've seen from you. Nice work. Keep it up. Um, but if you're in the production field, if, you're, if your time and your attention and your energy is on production, which is where I am too, all my time, my energy, my innovation is currently all focused on production. What I'm not doing right now is going out and selling. The whole point of production is sales. Production does not exist for the sake of production. Production exists for the sake of sales. And so um, what I'm working on is now getting this whole machine operation that I've got going here humming along so that I can go out and start crushing it with sales. And... It's a, it's a gas pedal, brake pedal kind of thing. Guys are looking at the amount of capital, the amount of cash they have on hand to pay for production upgrades, to save time, to save money, to make a better product. And they're thinking, I don't have enough sales. I don't have enough revenue coming in to justify that new production. The flip side is, if you had excess inventory piling up, you would have motivation and you would have product in hand to go out and push sales. Okay? I don't know how many of you guys have walked into a gun store and tried to convince a gun store owner to carry your line when you had nothing that could be delivered within two weeks. If you've ever tried to do that, it's hard. People don't like that. Um, if you walk, if, yeah, John says the sales show up if you have the production. Okay? If you are always at the edge of barely making your deadlines and you never have inventory, you never have excess product, then you're never in a good a position. You never have the opportunity to give strategic free holsters, samples, to Instagram influencers, uh, competition shooters, guys who have influence in the industry who them using your stuff can bring you more sales. If you have excess inventory, 
it's much easier to get over the hump of I just gave away time and money. Like it would be it's hard for me to go start a holster knowing I'm going to give it away and not get paid for it. It's way easier if I have a bin of completed holsters and I've already put in the time, I've already put in the material, I don't feel the sting of it anymore. It is totally easy for me to pull a finished holster out of there and hand it to somebody and say, here, check this out, run it for six weeks, and then call me back with your comments on it. And, you know, keep the holster, of course. Like, that's so much easier once I have the production. When you make your production efficient, you can offer dealers better margins. So in addition to having the motivation to go out and sell because you've got more production than you have sales, you need to go out and get sales, you can also be uh, more profitable at a lower margin. If you get production dialed so that you can step up the sales, then those two are working together. But I, I often feel in my own business and I see in other guys' businesses them um, misunderstanding the balance between sales and production. Okay, Some guys are lazy, just straight up lazy. And the only way they'll produce is if they've got sales and then they have to produce to meet deadlines. I've done that for years. I did that. That is miserable. I hate being under the gun all the time on deadlines because my production lags behind my sales. Okay? When I get a when my phone buzzes and I've got a web store order and it comes through and I just swiped a little alert and it's for a unit I've got in inventory and I know that later on in the evening like tonight I can just walk over there and pop it in a package and throw a shipping label on it and have it leave tomorrow morning. Like a guy orders at nine o'clock at night and his holster ships first thing the next morning. That's awesome. Or a guy orders at 10 a.m. and I get his holster out the door at noon same day because all I had to do was take it out of a bin, put it in a padded mailer with you know retail packaging and some swag and send it out the door. That's amazing. If you haven't experienced that, you need to experience that. It is unbelievable how good it feels to have inventory and sales come in and you're not like, oh man, I got to make that. You're like, oh, that's already done. Take it out of a bin, ship it, get it out of here. Got the kids to sleep now, time to work, says Shane Waller. Well, Shane, go get after it. Make a mess, make some dust, make some chips and make some money. Well, it looks like we're tapering down. It looks like the 100 viewers is a little out of reach since we're down in the low 70s now. I really appreciate all you guys coming and spending your time watching this. Just in time manufacturing is the China way. Chris, that's not true. China does do a lot of just in time manufacturing, but I do just in time manufacturing. Just in time manufacturing is a particular kind of manufacturing that has pros and cons. Okay? One of the big advantages I offer to the customers who buy molds from me is rapid turnaround in emergencies. So Last week, I had one of my customers ruin a mold for a large order he was working on that had to be delivered before Christmas. Okay? He, he called me up at night and you know, it was like late in the evening. I had three spare copies of that mold made an hour later they went out express and he had them the day after and he was back up and running like just in time manufacturing does have real benefits and you upcharge for it immediate ship keeps you locked into a smaller number of models you can offer nathan cnc molds keeps you locked into a smaller number of models you can offer you can either go wide or you can go deep I'm going deep. I'm not going wide. I made the decision a long time ago. Yeah, Matt, if you shared it, you are in the running to win that 1911 mold. I hope you're a holster maker. If not, I guess it's a cool wall ornament. Um, yeah, it's, Nathan, it's always the question of whether you want to go wide or deep. If you want to be an all-custom guy, then you're going wide. And what you're not going to get is deep 
in terms of maximizing the efficiency of your production. Because, you know, the amount of time it costs me to design and test and tool up one new gun model, CNC, is significant enough that it would be ridiculous of me to try to offer 60 models. And then if I, if I change my design, I got to go back and make a new iteration of every single one of those molds. It'd be murder. Okay? I love having stuff in bins. I don't keep huge amounts of inventory. I'm never 50 holsters deep on one model. But I always have enough. I always have enough of my core models, like my Glock appendix inside the waistband holsters. They're pretty much always in stock now, which is totally awesome. Anytime somebody orders one, it ships next day or same day. Um, I don't keep all my light bearing stuff in inventory, but I'm working toward that to have more of that in inventory so that when guys place an order, that just, it just goes out. Um, and part of the reason that's a big deal for me, Nate, is I've got so many other irons in the fire that if I had to stop and make one or two of something, it totally disrupts the rest of the workflow in my shop. It's hard to start wide and switch to deep. Uh, Nathan, it's painful, but it's totally doable. I used to be wide. I used to support 40 some models. Um, and I don't anymore. I pretty much now just have Glock, MMP, XDS, VP9, uh, and a couple of the small SIGs, 238, 938. And they're not even on my website, but I make them from time to time. Um, but I had enough other projects that I wanted to invest in machinery that would allow me to go incredibly deep and fast on my production process, and that will only work on a narrow range of models. I can't even begin to handle the inventory involved. If I tried to keep 10 holsters in inventory and I had 50 models available, 500 holsters in inventory would be stupid, totally ridiculous for me at the size my business currently is. And so I've gone deep, and the trade-off is when someone inquires about any full-size SIG, I refer them to somebody else. If they inquire about any Walther or any Ruger, I refer them to somebody else. If they inquire about any revolver, I refer them to somebody else. It means I pass on the business I'm not properly equipped to take on. There's no question I easily could make a holster for any one of those gun models and do it well, but it's not aligned with the core direction my business is headed. It's not aligned with my business model. It's not aligned with all the decisions I've taken, all the investments of money, all the investments of time, all the investments of thinking and energy to get to the point where I am. I'm on a trajectory. And trying to go wide now would be diverting myself, would be turning off that path and trading away a lot of what I've already gained. Roughly how many... Make some models plus light RMR threaded barrels. Do you offer 300 to 400 more Zane? Uh, 20. Barely. Yeah, about 20. I currently offer only right-handed. That's going deep, not wide. I'm not, I'm not doing anything for the lefties. Uh, I don't offer 19 with TLR1, 17 with TLR1, 34 with TLR1. I offer one Glock with TLR1 inside the waistband holster. I offer one Glock with X300 Ultra A or B inside the waistband holster. Uh, I don't populate all the little variations. I design generic molds that will fit all the different sizes that can run with that light. And then that's it. That's the holster. As a small custom guy, I'll take those customers you don't want. Jordan Johnson, send me an email, orders at Henry Holsters. If you want referrals, I'll take a look at your stuff. And if I feel comfortable referring people to you, I will refer people to you. Um, the guys I currently refer things to, anytime somebody, if I open an email from a customer and the word laser is anywhere in the email, if I see the word laser, I refer them to multi-holsters. Just because Tony's got all the actual lasers and I don't have any of them because I don't like them. But he has them, and he can make holsters for them. I got a couple up here, says Clark. Merry, Merry Christmas, and thank you for your work. Thank you for stopping by, Nelson Maldonado. I appreciate your time. I will let you know if you win. Um, so, yeah, I would love to see more guys in the holster field. 
get into non-membrane forming and start to go deep. And the other thing about going deep, this is major. One of the constant battles that we're facing in the holster field is trying to differentiate our brand from everybody else's brand. Okay? If you look at the number of guys who make a taco holster with a foamy clip, like that is a just a pit of failure if you go into that trying to differentiate yourself by saying, well, we offer one with a foamy. Yeah, okay. It's like saying, well, our car has tires. Okay. And so, um, yeah, Tony is an OG, Jordan. He totally is. I'm seriously considering deep since I'm a part-time holster maker, says Nathan. Another 1911 mold is being given away. Matthew Bills, yes it is. And since you already shared the feed, you're already entered and didn't even know it. That's the best way to win something, by accident. So if you're trying to differentiate your brand, deep over wide is better for differentiation every, every, every time. Because how many holster makers can really keep track of all the intricacies of all the different SIG models and also know all the Smith & Wesson revolvers and all the Ruger revolvers and also keep track of, you know, I can only master the ins and outs of so many different gun lines. There are so many variations. There are so many ins and outs. Um... I would rather pick a narrow area and absolutely master it. I would rather be, uh, if I was going to be a holster maker, new company starting now, um, I would pick some part, some segment of the market that appeared to be underserved. Little late here, what do you mean by deep? I know what you mean by wide. Mike Anthony, deep means focusing on a narrow range of products and investing time, money, and energy in aggressively optimizing the design and the production of those holsters for maximum efficiency. So you can produce them quickly at the lowest possible cost. You can afford to pick up dealers and give the dealers a good margin, and then you can really move volume. But you'll also, if you go deep, you'll be an expert in that range of products. Okay? I am amazed, flabbergasted, how often I see a holster maker post up in a forum or on a Facebook group, hey, I just accepted an order for this gun I've never done before. What should I know about it? If you're accepting orders for a gun you've never handled and know nothing about, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong, okay? Because you're making something that somebody's life could depend on and if you don't even know the gun, you are not properly equipped to make a holster that will provide all the safety, all the security, and all the performance that you should be providing. So um, I did take on a lot of guns I had not seen before when I was starting out, but I only ever did them as in-person customs. And I checked out the gun and I got to handle it and I was always able to have the client in my shop and have them try on the holster and explain to them, because as a holster maker, you're constantly involved in customer education. Jordan Johnson says, sweet beard, bro. Thank you. Um, you're always involved in customer education. I'm amazed by the number of customers who have come through my shop who couldn't execute a clean draw stroke to save their life. It's just all like fumbling, flailing, catching shirt, you know, kind of rocking and jiving and tugging, and eventually the gun comes out. Doesn't have a full firing grip. Trigger, can, you know, finger isn't indexed properly. Like guys who come into my shop and they go to test their holster out, or one of my favorites, see if I can find a replica. I'm not going to do this with a hot gun. One second. This is one thing that always drives me crazy. Do I offer a wide range of colors and attachments? I do not. Uh, 
Zach, I offer black. I offer only black. I offer no foamies. I offer no tech locks. I offer no paddles. I offer no speedies clips. I offer soft loops and tuckable soft loops. If you're going outside the waistband, I offer outside the waistband closed rigid loops. That's it. Period. Nice horizontal bandsaw says, John, yeah, guys, I ran the bandsaw for the first time today. It was awesome. It has already saved me so much hassle over the way I used to cut my aluminum bar stock, either on my second upright bandsaw, which is not the right speed for metal and doesn't have coolant, or for smaller bar stock, I was cutting them on a miter saw, and that was always just terrifying. Zach, it depends on your business model. It's true. Um, for my business model, mul offering lots of attachment options is not, a good is not a good option for me. I know that costs me some business. I'm okay with that. Anything you say yes to, you're saying no to other stuff. If you say yes to lots and lots of colors, you're saying no to holding effective inventory because you're never going to make two or three holsters in every color you carry. If, the more options you offer, the more difficult it comes to actually hold any inventory. If your goal, if you're just a holster shop and you're very comfortable working on a quick turnaround time after orders are placed and not holding any inventory, then offering color options and offering attachment options can make a lot of sense. I'm not only a holster shop. I'm also a machine shop. I do a lot of other work outside the holster field. I can't afford to be always under the tyranny of whatever orders are urgent at the moment from holsters that just came in. Nathan, that's true. There is room for wide makers and deep makers. However, I would argue very strongly that generally customers and users are better served by deep makers than by wide makers. Because if you find a deep maker who is very knowledgeable about the particular gun and the mode of carry you want to use, you find a, a holster maker who makes what you're looking for and they're very good, very experienced, it's their area of expertise, you are probably going to get a more carefully thought out and more skillfully executed holster to do that style of carry with that particular gun. Does that make sense? The internet has made it so easy to find specialty holster makers of lots of different kinds. Sir, I'm making me... David Stevens, I make a lot of guys reevaluate their business models. But back to draw stroke, I was talking about this earlier. As a holster maker, you often get involved in customer education. I know you've seen this. I've seen this all the time. It drives me crazy. Okay, here's my Blackhawk orange trainer. Okay, you make a strong side holster. Customer puts it on. They, they get the gun out. You know, they're, they're tugging and, and jiving and everything's messy. And they go to put it away and they do this crap. You guys seen that? I've seen that so many times. It's insane. There are enough businesses to make every niche market go deep, says Clark Truss. Clark Truss. Several deep makers work together and feed off each other are more beneficial. I'm so wide, bro. I used to be deep on an untapped market. Goals, not SIG. Jordan Johnson. Yeah, I often, it was very common five or six years ago for holster makers to have a blue gun exchange program where anything that you wanted that they didn't currently offer, uh, if you sent them the blue gun, they would give you a refund for the amount of the blue gun against your order, basically. They would buy a new blue gun to make your one-off holster. They basically looked at any new order as justification to buy the blue gun immediately. Crazy, crazy, stupid business model because they, those guys ended up with shelves. I did that. I ended up with a whole bunch of gun molds that I used almost never. Yeah, Rick, I'll hit you up in the morning for that 1911 mold. Right. Rick's not going to win the 1911 mold. The custom side of this business is a service, not a product, says Keith. That's true. Customization is a service, and the reason custom stuff should be priced more, should be priced more, is because it is an additional service. My problem is volume, says Richard Perry. Well, you can either 
wait until you've got the volume of sales and then scramble and scramble and scramble to try to keep up with production or you can build the production engine first so you've got the horsepower under the hood already and then you start stepping on the gas and producing more product and then you're free to go out and sell. I would recommend that model 10 times out of 10. Not only do you have a bunch of molds you'll never use again, but you're shipping a holster which hasn't been verified to fit a real gun. This is the other tremendous headache from the Battle of Blue Gun days. Uh, I always recommend, whenever possible, always fitting, test fitting every single holster with real steel. No matter how consistent your process is, only when you verify every holster with real steel and a customer calls you back and says the holster doesn't fit, can you say... I'm sure it passed stringent quality control before it left my shop. Every single holster is fit with a real gun. Not a taped blue gun, not a multi-mold, not a DIY drone, not a Blackhawk. Real gun. Verified. Uh, you can get around buying the real guns if you are uh, working in a gun store, you have a brother-in-law who works at a gun store, you're close to a gun store, and you have a good relationship with them. Uh, as long I've I've often gone to my local gun store and take measurements off guns, check out new models that come in, and every once in a while, uh, I don't do this anymore because now I've I own all the guns that I offer holsters for. Um, but a year or two ago, I would occasionally swing in there and test fit holsters with a real gun. Uh, like an example would be like somebody wanted a slightly unusual thing. Um, or I just wanted to, I wanted to double check that on an M&P 45 because mine didn't have the thumb safety in it. Just wanted to, before I shipped it out on my way to the post office, I'd stop into the gun store and grab one that had the safety just to make sure that I was 100% positive that everything was going to work out clean. If I win it, says John Schmitting, redraw for one of the other guys. Noted. Uh, Zane, I don't have suggestions for sales resources right now. But I would say you should listen to Gary Vaynerchuk's podcast. If you don't know Gary V, you need to know Gary V. If you go deep, you can get more than one of the same gun. I can't read that comment. It blew by too fast. And discover that their manufacturing isn't perfect either. I have four TDI knives for testing. Yeah, I got a couple Glocks in the shop I use for testing. You can take them by a local gun store. Thank you, Nathan Gallup. Have a very Merry Christmas. Um, don't cry yourself to sleep. But, I mean, seriously, think, man, like, when I talk to holster makers who come to me for CNC molds, almost always, they initially balk at the price, and then later, some of, the, some of them come back, a small number of them come back, and buy molds because they have gotten so underwater, they've gotten so far behind, or the production process is so inconsistent and so frustrating for them, that no matter how much time they seem to pour into it, without getting the molds fixed up front, everything downstream from there is affected. They've got to hand adjust every holster a little bit. There's no consistency in speed to their assembly because every holster fits a little bit differently. You know, If they can kick all those problems at the front door in mold design, every single holster they make off that mold, they're buying back however many minutes of time would have been wasted in the old process. And so it just, it pays for itself more and more and more and more, and it gets more and more momentum. And it's so satisfying to talk to holster makers who are using molds I've made for them and have them say, I just test fit 50 holsters and they were completely consistent. I didn't have to adjust a single one that has never happened before. I can't tell you how good that makes me feel. It's, it's tremendous. I would love to see holster makers not suffering through the pain of an inconsistent process and their end making products that are frustrating to them. I weep for the time I wasted in the old days every time I make a holster, says John Hopman. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I have flashbacks to how it used to be, and it just makes my skin crawl. So, unabashed, I am a huge advocate for deep over wide. You don't have to go deep. You do have to do you. Some guys love doing custom work. They love working with prints. They love hand-doing everything. 
They love the individuality of that. They don't mind the extra time it takes. They charge accordingly, or they're not really concerned about that making that much money because it's more of a hobby and they do it for enjoyment. If that's you, awesome. Enjoy it. Be happy. But if you're a holster maker and you're complaining about your process, you're complaining about the product because it's inconsistent, and you're complaining about the customers that are coming to you buying products you don't want to make that you still are listing on your web store for sale, stop it. If you have things that you're selling that you groan every time somebody orders it, get it off your web store. Stop selling it. If you hate making it, don't make it anymore. It doesn't serve the end user to have you cranky and just miserable in your shop. You know, If you really, really hate making holsters for the TLR4, don't make them anymore. And the more people say, you know what, I'm just not doing the TLR4 anymore, the more room there is in the market for that one guy who for some weird screwed up reason loves the TLR4 and loves making holsters for it, then there's actually enough market share available in one place for him to get that. The internet makes it totally doable. You know, When we were tied into local markets, and if you wanted a holster, you had to buy locally or you had to order out of a catalog. The wide business model was it. If your local gun store didn't carry it, if that meant you couldn't get a holster for it, like companies offered tons of subpar, poorly designed, and even more poorly constructed options that sold because nobody could find other places in the market where a better product was available. The internet completely changes that. Okay? If you want a holster for an oddball gun with an oddball attachment, you can find somebody to make it. You can. I got rid of left-handed and light-bearing options a few months ago and have been so much happier, says Ryan. Yeah, whatever it is that you don't want to make, stop making it. Okay? The business is not successful if you're miserable. It doesn't matter how many orders you've got. It doesn't matter how fast you make the stuff. It doesn't matter how much money you've got in the bank. If you're miserable, the business is not successful. Like, if it's killing you... You're not winning. Seth Thomas says, definitely guilty of that. Well, Seth, fix it. This is the, always the fear is, if I cut out these models that I hate, I won't have enough sales. I won't have enough revenue. Well, all the time that you could be using to go out and get the sales you want is currently being wasted making the product you hate. Some people are very well equipped to manage unusual customers with unusual guns with oddball attachments. I'm not. It's not how my shop is designed. I don't take custom in-person appointments anymore. Okay, But here's the thing. Once you go deep, you can gradually go wider and stay at depth. But if you go wide first, if you're already wide, you will always be scrambling. You'll always be living in the moment under the tyranny of the urgent orders that have to happen this week. And you will never have the free time, the free energy, and the free money to go deep. So... My model, what I recommend, what I think is the best for me, hands down, is go really deep, deep as I can, and then from there, as I want and as the market allows me to, widen that deep hole that I've dug until I find a balance where I'm happy. You know, I added a couple of SIGs, I added a VP9, I added, you know, I've got the XC1 and the APL and the 300 Ultra and the TLR1. I don't do the TLR2, I don't do the TLR3, I don't do the TLR4, I don't do any of the Insight lights, I don't do any of the Glock lights. Okay? There's a whole bunch of things I'm just, no matter what, they're never going to be in my product line. Period. Just not doing them. Yeah, TDI sheets. I mean, anytime you're dealing with manufactured items, you've got the variations in your own process and you've also got to cope with the variations in the, man, in the process of the manufacturer who makes the thing you're making for. 
TDI knives have variations. Glocks have variations. You're, you're, you're going to have to push the clutch, Richard, at some point. If you want to shift gears, you, you, I mean, it's kind of a stupid analogy. Like, if you want to get into another gear, you have to let off the gas for a minute, and you've got to push the clutch. It's going to mean a dip in sales. If you take 60% of the items on your web store and you remove them from your web store, guess what? It's going to mean a dip in sales. There's no way around that. But once you have that time freed up by those missing sales, if you aggressively channel that time into optimizing the production on the stuff you've kept and then take some of that time, a little bit of it left, and you go out and you chase sales for those increasingly optimized items, you can get through that shortfall. You might have to hustle and hustle and hustle and hustle and hustle and hustle and make cold calls and walk into gun stores and give stuff away to Instagram influencers and shoot YouTube videos and revamp your website and pay for some Google AdWords and pay for some targeted Facebook marketing. You may have to do a whole bunch of different things that are outside your comfort zone. But you can get through the shortfall if you decide you're going to make the change and push through it. But you're never going to end up with the product line and the business you really want if you wait for it to happen. You're the owner. You're the driver. It's you. If you don't make it happen, it's not going to happen. I'm getting all fired up. I need to call it a night. I very much appreciate all you guys watching. Thank you to those of you who shared the feed. I will go through later tonight and check on who all shared the feed and assign numbers and then go ahead and pick a winner with random number generator online. There will be one more Facebook Live feed this week where I will be giving away the last blemish 1911 mold. So keep an eye on my Instagram page and Facebook company page for announcements about when that broadcast will be. Thank you guys for a, uh, a great year. 2016 has been awesome. I've t gone in a whole bunch of new directions. Facebook Live was a new thing for me this year. Uh, I've been loving it. I feel I've been able to uh, meet and interact with a whole bunch of cool people who I wouldn't have talked to otherwise. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share uh, the information I do have with you in hopes that it benefits your business and makes you happier and more profitable, but mostly happier. Um, I still do have Swift Presses on sale. I've got a handful left in inventory. The code FAST40 will get you 40 bucks off a of Swift Press. If you are busy and you don't want to take the time to experiment and make your own, or you're already sure you want to move into non-membrane forming and you'd rather just go bigger right off the bat and get a former that can handle four molds at a time from the get-go, hit me up at henryholsters.com. Look for a Swift, the blue Swift Press button and use the code FAST40 for 40 off and free shipping in the lower 48 on your Swift Press. Thank you very much, guys. I would love to see those of you who go out and start building, if you build your own non-membrane former, and part of the motivation was this Facebook live feed and some of the info I shared here. I would love it if when you finish that up and you actually start making shells with that non-membrane former, tag me in. On Facebook, on Instagram, wherever it is, tag me in. I want to see what you're doing with it. Be an encouragement to me. Thank you very much, guys. Have a great night.